Predlažem da nastavimo dalje, pošto kolega Dragan Prlja i njegovi koautori su bili sprečeni da dođu danas. I ja bih sada pozvao, I would first like to switch to English because of our next speaker coming from Germany. Um, Eva Weinberg, the judge of Constitutional Administrative Court in Regensburg, great scholar and a good friend of mine that will share some of her thoughts on the topic of the dealing with sexual orientation in changing jurisprudence, namely um, issues dealing with um, sexual orientation and gender in Germany have been quite a hot topic in recent years. We also had the decision of Bundesverfassungsgericht about the third positive gender, drittes positives Geschlecht, that you can pretty much state yourself not only being male or female, but also the third positive gender. So all these related issues are quite, um, um, how should I say, actual on, yes. in Germany. And please, the floor is yours. Share your thoughts with us. Thank you. Okay, first of all, thank you for the organization and for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. In my presentation today, I would like to talk about how sexual orientation is dealt with in jurisprudence. And my focus will be on a very actual topic in Germany, the so-called third gender or third sex, or also third option. I will refer to the jurisdiction of the federal constitutional court in Germany. So when I talk about the court or the constitutional court in the following, I always mean the court in Germany. The topic of the conference is challenging traditional constitutional ideas in terms of modern state and politics. I think that the treatment of people's sexual orientation in the German jurisprudence is one of the topics that has changed the most since the enactment of the constitution until today. What is exciting is that the text of the constitution has remained unchanged. And this phenomenon in, in German is called Verfassungswandel, when translation means constitutional change. And I will explain this term later on. So first of all, I would like to make some definitions clear so that we can see it later on a case I would like to describe. Um, First, trans, I will talk about transsexuality. Um, transsexuality means, according to the medical definition, the wish to live and be recognized as a member of the opposite sex. So it's a wish. And intersexuality or diverse means the doctor cannot clearly classify them as either a man or a woman based on their external sexual characteristic, char characteristics or their genome. So, Intersexuality will be defined by a doctor's assessment and not by a subjective feeling how not a person uh, feels about her or, or himself. Later, my main point is going to be about the diverse case that Miroslav already mentioned. So now I'm going to talk about the constitutional transformation, the so-called um, Verfassungswandel. And in a first step, it seems to me useful to explain what it doesn't mean because there is um, a risk that this term can be misunderstood. The term constitutional change is not used when the legislature modifies the constitutional text. Constitutional change in this meaning is made by the constitutional court. The constitutional court is the ultimate interpreter of the constitution. Its job is on the one on one hand to make the constitution speak and on the other hand to make the um, on and to keep it in time and on the other hand to preserve its central statements. For the definition, I'm referring to comments made by the former president of the constitutional court, Andreas Foskule. Even though the court is independent, the court is not free to do Verfassungswandel con con, um, constitutional change any time. It always needs justification. That means they have to ask like experts in topic of medicine or um, uh, psychologists, for example, in the aspect of homosexuality or sexual or orientation. Uh, 
Um, the constitution is like any law, it's open to interpretation. Not every form of interpretation is constitutional change, um, but we can say that constitutional change is like a really tough form of interpretation of the constitution. The um, ex-president of the, of the Kurd said, like this um, term I would use, in a short way that Verfassungswandel is a change of meaning without changing the text. Okay. Constitutional uh, change can therefore also be described as a special form of constitutional interpretation. However, this way to interpret this is also criticized because we are far away from the original hor horroristic moment. And now, knowing this term, I would like to make it more clear on Article 2 and Article 3 of the German Constitution. Doesn't work. Yeah, no. now we have to far. Again. Okay. These two articles have remained almost unchanged, but nevertheless, under the influence of the constitutional court, their understanding and content have been significantly changed. Article two pretends to the personal freedoms and article three is the right of equality. And I have compared the two versions. So here you can see article two is the same, 1949 and today. And article three, the green parts, I'm not sure if you can see it, um, have been edited um, later, but the yellow part is for the sexual orientation, a really relevant part has also been the same. I would now like to briefly describe this change and showing, uh, giving you a historical overview of what was happening. Okay. So we came from um, 1957. The court had to rule on whether the penal code, which provided for the punishment of homosexual men, was in accordance with the constitution. At that time, the court said that the punishment of homosexuality in man is legal. And I would like to citate one, one part of this decision to make the difference clear between now and their time. So the court said, male homosexuals often aspire to a homosexual group, but usually reject family ties and tend to constantly change partners. If one takes into account the greater sexual aggressiveness man of man, it is evident that the danger of the spread of homosexuality is far greater in men than in women. So 1957, the Kurt said, homosexual men are much more aggressive than women. Then homosexuality was punishable until 1994. And after the criminalization was abolished, a series of laws followed that gave homosexuals certain rights and obligations. So in 2001, the civil partnership law was introduced that gave like more rights to the homosexuals near marriage, but not a marriage. Later, also tax law and heritage law was changed. Finally, in 2017, the act on the introduction of the marriage of, of the right to marriage for persons of the same sex was adopted. This allows homosexual couples to enter into marriage in Germany now. And now I would like to, um, to read another sentence from the court in 2013 that was made about a tax law decision. There the same court, like some years later to the same rules said, to ignore the fact that children also grow up in civil partnerships would amount to indirect discrimination, discrimination precisely because of the sexual orientation of the partners. Such unequal treatment cannot be justified by the aspect of typification. So we see like this is one of the important points, we come from crimin crimin criminality to marriage for all. In the last part, I would like to tell you about the decision from the third sex. 
The case constellation is that a person, I will just call the person A, and I tried not to use any gender, um, has applied to the registry office for a correction in the birth register. The person applied for inter or diverse to be entered instead of female, or if that was not possible, into diverse into the register. The register office rejected the application because such an application is not possible under the personal status law. The pe person A thought, fought through all instances and finally lodged a constitutional complaint at the constitutional court. The person A claims that the provisions of the Personal Status Act violate the general right of personality and is also a discrimination on grounds of gender of the constitution. So at first I would like to see have a short look at the rules. There's the section 21, paragraph 21. There was ruled that there's necessary a re registry of birth, the sex. And in paragraph 22, um, there was the rule that if a person as a child cannot be assigned to either the female or the male sex, the civil status case shall be entered in the registry of birth without such indication. The court made the decision that these laws are against the constitution because the belonging to one gender is of outstanding importance of individual identity. So it means a K position. Also, the court said that an open gender is not enough. And the third point is that was like um, the argumentation from the uh, from the other courts before that also the bureaucratic and organization afford is to be accept. And now I was looking at this decision to see where the constitutional change for Passungswandel can be seen. So the court said that the text of the Article 3 of the Constitution allows without difficulty to include them, various persons, into the protection. The article speaks generally of gender, which can also be a gender behind male or female. And the next point is, and this is like to, to see the change, the history of origins does not contradict this understanding. The fact when formulating the constitution in 1949, the authors probably did not imagine people of a different sex as male or female does not contradict this. These people are to be included into, in the protection against discrimination due to actual knowledge of their gender identity. And on the last slide, I would like um, to talk about, to take a look in the future. I think that this is not going to be the end of the de development of sexual rights. In this respect, I would like to conclude with a brief outlook. In particular, the Minister Locke Kurt has expressed doubts about the compatibility of the new law and has submitted the case to the Federal Constitutional Court for a decision. The possibility of having changes made to the civil status rights register is in fact strictly limited because the category diverse now is only open to intersex persons and is linked to physical conditions. A medical certificate is normally required and as a result, other groups of persons will not be able to make such a change in the civil status register. The court also doubts that a medical certificate is required and that it does not open on how the person subjectively feels. In this respect, it remains to be seen how the constitution formed by the constitutional court will change again. So thank you for your attention.
Vielen Dank. Thank you very much, dear Eva. This is a controversial topic. This is a controversial decision. Lots of consequences on uh, legislative levels in Germany, on a federal and Stufe level as well. So we'll also discuss it a little bit more in, in the discussion probably. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. So the next speaker doesn't need uh, an introduction. <laughs> the next one is my good friend and colleague, Dr. Milos Stanic, who will present his paper that he wrote uh, the, with uh, also a colleague of ours, Jovana Rajic Cialic from the Institute of Comparative Law. And it has to do with um, bearing of religious markings in a working place, the reasonable adaptation and the case of Eveida. Please. Poštovane koleginice i kolege, velika mi je čast i zadovoljstvo sada da vas pozdravim sa ovog mesta i želim pre svega da izrazim zadovoljstvo što smo i dalas bili u prilici da čujemo mnoštvo inspirativnih izlaganja kao što je to bio slučaj i uče. Prosto čovek da poželi da ova konferencija Beogradski ustavno-pravni forum traje nešto duže od ova dva dana, ko zna možda ćemo i u godinama koje dolaze to i uspeti, tako da je ovo sada jedan početak, može se reći ne početak u skladu sa onim da se prvi mačići u vodu bacaju, nego jedan početak koji obećava i koji je zalog za budućnost ovog ustavno-pravnog foruma. Kada je reč o temi kojom smo se uvažena koleginica Rajić Alić, koja je danas opravdano odsutna i ja bavili, ona je zapravo spoj dva instituta iz dve različite, ali ipak na neki način povezane grane prava. Dakle, koleginica Rajić Alić se bavi radnim pravom, dok se ja bavim ustavnim pravom i mi smo promišljali šta bi bila onako jedna adekvatna, najbolja tema koja bi mogla da odgovori onom imperativu društvene i naučne opravdanosti. Na kraju smo došli na ideju da se bavimo slobodom, odnosno pravom na slobodu misli, savesti, veroispovesti i to u jednom njenom aspektu, u jednom njenom ispoljavanja, to je nošenje verskih simbola na radnom mestu. U kontekstu prakse Evropske cude za ljudska prava, uvek aktuelna imajući u vidu da je Srbija članica Saveta Evrope kao i sve države regiona, tako da apsolutno tema je onako na prvi pogled opravdala, izbor teme opravdao tu svoju, taj svoj imperativ naučne i društvene opravdanosti. Posebno smo se osvrnuli na slučaj Čaplin i drugi protiv Ujedinog kraljevstva, odnosno jedan deo tog predmeta, a to je onaj deo koji se odnosio na službenicu British Airwaysu, gospođu Evitu. Tokom istraživanja suočili smo se, kao što se često istraživači suočavaju sa brojnim izazovima i delovalo je da naše istraživanje ne klizi ka putu, već ka bespuću. Naime, mi smo u našem istraživanju spojili dva instituta, a kasnije smo to videli izuzetno složena, izuzetno složena i za sam Evropski sud za ljudska prava, a kamoli za nas dvoje. Iako to na prvi pogled ne izgleda pravo na slobodu misli, savesti, veroispovesti koje je pravo iz one takozvane prve korpe, prve grupe ljudskih prava i koje je kao takvo utemeljeno u svim ustavima zemalja koje pripadaju takozvanom liberalno-demokratskom tipu ustavnosti, nije tako bilo dobro prihvaćeno među tvorcima Evropske konvencije zašto ljudskih prava i osnovnih sloboda. Oni su prosto to smo se iznenadili, želeli to pravo i da odbace. Jer su videli nešto što će uslediti u samoj primeni konvencije i nešto sa čime se kasnije suoči Evropski sud za ljudska prava, a to je samu složenost i obuhvatnost prava koja se jemče 
članom deveti pomenute konvencije. To je ova ustavno-pravna složenost. Kada je reč o drugom delu našeg rada sa kojim se suočila koleginica Raji Čalić, to je sam pojam razumnog prilagođavanja koji nam dolazi iz Sjedinih američkih država, odnosno iz Severne Amerike, ne samo iz SAD-a, već i iz Kanade. I taj pojam je nekako prelazeći Atlantik raspršio se na neka svoja tri dela i došao je nekako u Evropu nedovoljno definisan i maglovit. U Sjedinje američkih država i Kanadi, kada je reč o nošenju verskih obeleža na radnom mestu, taj pojam, odnosno institut razlogog prilagođavanja, se mnogo striktnije primenjuje nego što je to slučaj u Evropi. Naprosto u Evropi ne postoji ni saglasje oko toga šta razumno prilagođavanje znači. Da li razumno prilagođavanje znači na prvom mestu stvaranje određene obaveze prilagođavanja radnog mesta na strani poslodavca, ali obaveze koja njemu ne bi predstavljala odveć veliki teret. Jer kao što sama sintagma razumno prilagođavanje kaže radi se o prilagođavanju koje vrši poslodavac kako bi određenoj grupaciji zaposlenih omogućio da, s obzirom na njihovu posebnu situaciju, ostvaruju prava u vezi sa tom posebnom situacijom na svom radnom mestu. Primjera radi, poslodavac je, što nije sporno ni u Americi, a ni u Evropi, dužan da osobama, odnosno licima sa invaliditetom, obezbedi takozvano razumno prilagođavanje. Međutim, u Evropi, kada je reč o slobodi misli, savesti, veroispovesti, to nije slučaj, jer, rekli smo, prvo shvatanje u evropskim državama ovog termina, drugo shvatanje da li razumno prilagođavanje znači efikasno, odnosno ostvarivo razumno prilagođavanje, a treće shvatanje sublimira ova prva dva shvatanja i znači i jedno i drugo. Tako se otprilike i opredeljuju evropska zakonodavstva uporedno pravno gledano. Razumno prilagođavanje je dakle složen pojam, pogotovo u materiji slobode misli, savesti, veroispovesti i sa tim pojmom se suočio i Evropski sud za ljudska prava. Naravno, pitamo se sada šta ga čini toliko složenim i šta u stvari stvara tu zamagljenost prilikom same primene ovog instituta u ovoj specifičnoj materiji. Kada se malo bolje razmisli, onako, na drugi pogled, shvatamo da primjera radi pomenuta situacija invaliditeta određenog lica i ispoljavanja njegovih verskih sloboda faktički nije ista i taj fakticitet utiče i na ova ploćenja, odnosno primjenu pravnih normi. Naime, jasno je da jedno lice ne bira da li će, nažalost, biti lice sa invaliditetom ili ne, dok kod razumno prilagođavanje u sferi slobode religijskih uverenja postoji ona fina sloboda, odnosno mogućnost, mogućnost pre svega da zaposleni lice u radnom odnosu ostavi tu svoju slobodu ispred vrata poslodavca, pogotovo ako je to interes samoga poslodavca. Evropski sud za ljudska prava se u nekoliko predmeta koji se u samom radu obrađuju suočavao sa problemom ispoljavanja, odnosno nošenja verskih simbola na radnom mestu i Sumarno gledano možemo samo kazati da je Evropski sud imao jedan onako krajnje suzdržan stav prema tome i davao je široku marginu, široku mogućnost procene državama članicama Saveta Evrope da one u skladu sa konkretnom situacijom u konkretnoj državi procene da li je zadiranje u slobodu predviđenu članom devetim konvencije, opravdano ili ne. Taj stav Eroska suda za ljudska prava, imajući u vidu naša neka razmišljanja, promišljanja, je potpuno opravdan. 
prvo svaka država članica Saveta Evrope ima svoje određene specifičnosti i ne može se stvoriti u tumačenju ovoga člana i u primjeni njegovoj određeno jedinstveno tumačenje takvo koje će samim državama koje su najbolje pozvane i zapravo jedino pozvane da odrede kolika je širina te slobode nametnuti odgovarajuće rešenja koja neće biti skrojena po njihovoj meri. Onda bi se pravo potpuno izvrglo u svoju suprotnost. A to je Evropski sud za ljudska prava veoma uspešno i vešto izbjegavao. Drugim rečima o institutu razumno prilagođavanja nije moglo da bude ni reči. Sada došla je jedna zanimljiva situacija sa slučajem Čaplin i drugi protiv Velike Britanije, pa su se pobornici ovog instituta ponadali da su došla neka svetla vremena za primenu ovog instituta u ovoj materiji. U tom slučaju se radilo zapravo o dve gospodje, dva lica. Dakle, jedna od njih je radila u jednoj bolnici u Engleskoj i nosila je lančić. Engleski sudovi su presudili da poslodavac je naravno zahtevao da ona taj lančić ukloni, ukratko kazano. Na kraju krajeva engleski sudovi su presudili da su zahtevi poslodavca bili opravdani u demokratskom društvu, imajući u vidu da radi u bolnici i da je moguće da prvo dođe do njenog povređivanja, a zatim i do povređivanja samih pacijenata, pošto je lančić naravno kako se i nosi, nosilo oko vrata, tako da u tom nekom smislu, u tom slučaju nije bilo ništa sporno i Evropski sud za ljudska prava je bio na trasi svojih ranijih stanovišta. E kada je reč o gospođe Vidi koja je radila u British Airwaysu, tu je malo Evropski sud za ljudska prava odstupio od svojih stanovišta, međutim ne toliko da opet ide ka institutu razvojnog prilagođavanja, već je više postavio granice o tome o tome kada je opravdano mešanje države članice u sferu slobode misli, savesti i veroispovesti. Drugim rečima, Evropski sud zvjetska prava je postavio jasne kriterijume o tome šta bi sve odnosno o čemu bi sve trebalo sudovi u državama članicama da vode računa prilikom procenjivanja da li se radi o nedozvoljenom zadiranju u zajemčene slobode. Bez obzira što se napravio neki korak, nije se otišlo dalje od toga. Na kraju krajeva koleginica Rajić Alić i ja smo zaključili da je Ovako stanovište Evropskog suda za ljudska prava odveć opravdano. Prosto gledan Evropskog suda za ljudska prava prati određene potrebe i društvene okolnosti u ovoj materiji i definitivno u odnosu na američku situaciju uvažava postojanje različitosti u različitim državama članicama i čini određena fina podešavanja koje su samo prvi korak ka eventualnom menjanju stavova. Ipak, lično, mišljenja smo da za radikalne zaokrete nije vreme. Naprosto, Erosi sud za ljudska prava je postavio određene osnove, a sigurno će ti osnovi, odnosno možemo očekivati da će ti osnovi biti menjani u skladu sa samim razvojem društvenih odnosa i možda ćemo negde u budućnosti, možda će neko u budućnosti moći da piše i da govori o prihvatanju prakse razvojnog prilagođavanja u materi nošenja verskih obrežene radno mestu, prakse za koju po našem stanovištu još uvek nije vreme. Hvala vam mnogo. Puno hvala, dragi kolega Staniću. I sad imam zadovoljstvo. Actually, I'll switch to English. So now I have a pleasure to invite our 
last but definitely not least speaker for this conference this year, Professor Dr. Stella Dima, professor originally from Albania, from Tirana, now living and working in Berlin at the University of Stein, Steinbeis, University of Berlin. So she will present her paper on securing workers' rights in times of pandemic, working from home dilemma. I would only like to add that after two years of constitutional law and uh, two years, sorry, two days of constitutional law and two days of political science, I think Stella will give us a breath of fresh air because she will be um, dealing with this issue from a little bit different perspective since she's a doctor of psychology. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invite. It's really nice to be here. Um, yeah, as you said, I'm not a lawyer, so um, I will try to bring here my uh, perspective on um, how the, the employers tackled the work from home mistrust, I would say, uh, as you'll see in my um, reflection here, that um, it, especially in Albania occurred uh, quite a lot. So um, yeah, the topic that I come here today with is, uh, as you can see, securing workers' right in times of pandemic, working from home dilemma. Um, it is not a topic that, um, th that aims to answer, to, to give ultimate answers. Instead, it aims to actually raise more questions. So what exactly are we doing um, in this perspective? Um, and my, uh, gen my, my uh, main focus is the labor market in um, Albania during this time of crisis, during the pandemic. Um, so yeah, just a bit of, oops. Um, so yeah, just, just a bit of introduction um, as governments around the world actually started to, in, to, to encourage workers to leave uh, employees to work from home. Um, in order to break the chain of infections, not everybody actually did that. Um, as uh, statistics show in Germany, which would be considered a high trust society, uh, only 30 to 50% of employers allowed uh, work from home. Uh, it, it, here I need to specify when they could. So it's practically this is more office work, not, not factories uh, for sure. And in Albania, the number was less than 20%. And actually this 20% this is more the governmental um, institutions which could. Uh, instead, the private uh, sector actually did almost uh, not allow it at all. Um, what I've seen in my interviews, um, as I will show, these are like a couple of research questions that I aimed to um, to, to look into um, during this time is um, I found that there seems to be a lack of trust. Uh, it seems to be a lack of trust in this, uh, in this scenery uh, where employers do not trust in their employees to be actually working from home. Like they wanna do this sort of headcount in the office. If everybody's in the office, despite whether they're working or not in the office, at least they're in the office so they kind of justify their salary. Uh, which certainly is not good, but um, uh, as, as the statistics also show uh, in Albania, there is a lack of trust, not only in, in the labor market. Uh, statistics show that the people in general do not, uh, do not trust the government. They do not trust the employers. They do not trust the legal system. They do not trust the educational system, not even the health system. So all of these combined actually do bring us to a very dark scenery of, um, of the pandemic uh, as well. Um, these are, um, this is just uh, uh, another in, 
uh, more more detailed um, perspective on the work from home, which is actually not a new thing. It's not the first time that we experience work from home. This is not only a pandemic thing. This is not only an emergency uh, situation. Technically, work from home also in um, uh, due to economic reasons was experimented in in different uh, cases in different uh, in many states. And uh, like, for instance, I bring here one of um, one experiment uh, conducted in uh, 2014, when um, uh, call center employees were were encouraged to work from home, and their and their results actually are very interesting, because actually it showed that work from home was actually more more. Uh, efficient, so it increased the performance, and of course, uh, everybody is uh, nowadays also um, sort of um, stressing the fact that, of course, not commuting to work, not um, uh, not necessitating any more as many sick days as previously. So practically, when you just have a mild headache at home, you can still work since you don't have to to travel to the office and so. So um, practically, we see that there is actually kind of more work and, and the time of work is actually uh, increased. Um, yeah, this is a statistic of uh, EU. The, in EU states, the average trip in 2019 was 25 minutes one way, single trip. So it makes like one hour just commuting. Um, and yeah, time of, uh, of work is actually uh, increased during this, um, so the, the work from home, because technically workers do not, um, do not anymore like switch off their, their computers at five sharp, but they give kind of more, uh, a bit of more uh, time. So now um, what I did in, in pursuing this interest of mine to, uh, to understand what actually is going on in this perspective is I did, uh, I conducted 12 in-depth interviews with um, employees from, um, from companies that could offer home, uh, work from home, as I said. So practically it was office work of consulting companies, research companies, um, or architecture and design companies. So practically work, places that only necessitate sort of one computer, um, not, um, not factories, as, as I said. So uh, three main issues that I found is um, certainly demand of, uh, to appear in the office if uh, employers didn't have symptoms, didn't show symptoms, despite their uh, contacts. Like this is the case of one uh, lady employee whose uh, husband was sick uh, with COVID at home. And uh, like the husband, so she's actually leaving 24 seven with uh, the man. And uh, the, employ uh, the, the employer demanded that she appeared uh, in the office every day as long as she didn't uh, uh, show symptoms, which certainly is not um, uh, the directive. Um, only when sick they could stay at home um, and um, and, and um, work, like when they have mild symptoms, because certainly uh, in in severe symptoms nobody can actually work. Um, and this is the case of um, somebody responding that actually, despite the fact that uh, every day, and this is this is 2020, by the way, so it's like the peak of uh, the, the pandemic, although we're now facing another peak. So technically the story is repeating itself, but the data are um, older than, than this time. So practically, despite the fact that everybody, that, that almost every day people are showing up uh, with contacts or symptoms and testing positive, uh, employers wouldn't really care in respecting health and safety measures. Moreover, what um, is to me more problematic is actually the, the stability at work and the, the, the security to actually keep the work, which Salary can be reduced, and it actually has been reduced, uh, especially in, in um, Albania, but uh, at the time where lockdown was stricter uh, and um, uh, the government like had this curfew times until 1.30 uh, p.m. Uh, 
Um, so practically only half day, um, uh, people could actually move. Employers still demanded people to actually go to work despite the fact that only half day they could actually get out of home. And uh, they cut, uh, the, most of the uh, private employers cut the salaries half with the um, justification that, um, yeah, it's only half day of work. So they, even in that case, they wouldn't care of people to actually continue half of the rest of the day uh, working from home. But yeah, that was the, the solution that they gave. And this is um, one case of a person, uh, of one of the interviewees that actually could work from home due to her uh, remote location, like the remote address from the workplace. However, uh, the lady was feeling very uh, um, anxious about her workplace because she was uh, having the feeling that, um, yeah, technically um, in Albania, is, the, the workplace is, is as insecure as anybody can get fired the next day, like uh, just with a phone call. And, um, Technically, this, this issue of trust, to my understanding, goes, goes even further. None of, the, uh, none of the respondents in my 12 in-depth interviews ever thought of bringing any of these uh, cases or issues to court because nobody ever trusted that it would have been worth it. So practically, everybody feels like, well, the court is corrupt, so practically... Uh, whatever I do, my uh, not only my employer will win, but I will still get uh, uh, lose the job, and I will also lose the money of the the court procedures and 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 um, all the other uh, things. Um, and yeah, also uh, talking about uh, trust issues, I can also share with you another reflection, like uh, when when you see that. Um, the, the situation of trust is so low in these cases, uh, there's no wonder of vaccine hesitancy and the fact that um, uh, people would think that they could get uh, spied on or controlled or tracked or like uh, even sterilized. That's like uh, the, the biggest conspiracy. Um, so what can we actually do is uh, of course employers need to and this is something that they uh, typically adhere to um, to uh, increase safety measures at work so increase the health and safety uh, measures uh, the 3g versus the 2g rule is the the uh, lo losing now the tests so practically the 3g includes uh, being uh, vaccinated uh, um, recovered from the infection or tested now um, uh, technically this is more a general uh, rule not applied in Albania as you see also in Serbia like uh, yeah um, vaccine certificates but not that everybody is actually concerned with um, and yeah, the, the situation, uh, unfortunately, is still developing. And as I said in the beginning, I, I don't aim to provide ultimate answers. And actually, I cannot provide an ultimate answers because uh, probably everybody heard that just yesterday we got new variants, so um, new developments. And I believe uh, this is a story that we need to follow closely uh, also, um, yeah, in the, in the following, in the upcoming days. Um, so yeah, just to conclude, um, what we hear all the time about the workplace is a lot of stressors, and for sure one of the additional stressors now is the lack of physical safety, in my um, opinion. So basically, um, it's it's um, uh, and although uh, some uh, some people are also are reporting isolation stress. And like the difficulty to work from home, especially in, in uh, when leaving alone or when leaving with large families, of course, this is not uh, the easiest thing to do. Uh, but yet again, also um, a lot of employees are reporting like the, the physical stress to actually travel and to meet people um, at work. Um, we certainly need to talk about trust and to increase uh, the, the trust to, to raise awareness uh, about uh, the, the work from home, etc. And um, 
of course, despite the fact that uh, research are showing um, benefits of work from home, we still are not actually quite adapted to that. Um, it is time for Albania, especially, uh, which is my case, uh, to change not only the mindset, but also the legal framework and, of course, allow employees to choose where they work in, uh, in, in the light of increased health and safety uh, measures. Um, yeah, now ultimate answers and certainly further research is also important to be conducted um, for uh, to to see the employer's views which uh, in this case was not my uh, focus that was what i prepared i hope it's thank you so much dear stella this is important insight and input for all of us to consider when dealing with the legal measures to to direct everything in the right direction so thank you so much for your contribution and